All right, I'm gonna try something that I haven't done before. I'm gonna actually do a video of what's usually my podcast, and um, we're gonna see what happens with that. So there'll be a video, which you'll find here on blackmanthegun.tv, and then the podcast will be separately. It won't be the same video, it won't be the same audio. You actually get a chance to see Alan Gottlieb in person as we do a little conversation at the end. So we're gonna try this, all right? Good Lord, this is this is difficult. But after uh, how many episodes has this been? What number am I on? This is uh, 618. So after 619 episodes, this is what you want. We, we trying to uh, make ourselves entertained. You with me? All right. You've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with a Gun Show. Um, this week, I got a conversation with Alan Gottlieb, and um, it was just a nice conversation. If you don't know anything about the Second Amendment Foundation, I want to invite you to learn about it, to check it out, and maybe even show up for the Gun Rights Policy Conference, which is going to be in Phoenix, Arizona this year. This show is brought to you by me, author of uh, Black Man with a Gun Reloaded, and this is my autobiographical book which actually is more than an autobiograph. It's um, about gun rights. It's about how it is woven into my life, into my history, into my ancestry. The back of the book is full of um, a glossary with terms and things that, if you are new to the community, make you look smarter. And um, if you wonder how a guy who has been doing this almost uh, 12 years on a microphone and over 20 years as a firearms instructor, trainer, and activist got this far, you'll find out about it here at Black Man with a Gun Reloaded, book published by White Feather Press in 2014. You can get your autographed copy. Um, you can contact me directly at blackmanwithagun at gmail.com, or you can go directly to Amazon and get it at book.blackmanwithagun.com, and it'll pull up right there. Um, this firearm right here, is a LAR Grizzly. It is a 5.56. It uh, has all ergo grips, cool stuff on here. Um, created by a Falcon Industries and a friend of mine from Ergo Grips did this whole thing. It's all Cerakoted. It's Maryland legal, so the barrel's a little long, but um, it's nice. All right. Just recently this week, we talked about um, Juneteenth and reparations and I was in the news this week but I want to give you some back history to some of that stuff because folks kind of gloss over it they do so let's do a little history back in January 1st 1863 you might have heard of something called the Emancipation Proclamation well that was something that Abraham Lincoln wrote penned that on April uh, on January 1st in 1863 that all people will be free and this was talking about blacks in general the African American the American that was enslaved in Africa would now be now be free well that was all cool and good to, to write down but there wasn't a news there wasn't a podcast there wasn't a telegraph there wasn't stuff that could be instant like it is now so even though we had communications Back then, nobody really wanted to let that known be known that um, slaves were now free, that um, the black man was equal to the white man. It sounded good on paper. Um, it was under pressure that Abraham Lincoln did what he did. It wasn't all sunshine and roses. It was a little difficult times for the president back then. And imagine being a slave. Imagine hearing that on the first of a new year you're no longer a slave it's huge right well every Christmas every New Year's Eve they have something called watch night service in churches and in the African American church they celebrate watch night and we have lost that whole thing if you listen to my show before around Christmas time around holidays you know that I bring this up but I'm telling you how it's connected to now. 
on watch night. They were watching as the clock struck 12 that they would be free. So what do free people do? They bang pots and pans. They fire celebratory gunfire because only free men and women can own guns. A big deal. We kind of forget that part. Only free people can own guns. So they're firing off shotguns because that's what they had mostly and rifles celebrating their freedom on January 1st, 1863. That's how Watch Night began and slowly became like a church thing where you wanted to bring in the new year in church on your knees, praising God. But in 1863, it was to be free. Physically free. You got me? All right. Well, even though that decree came out in 1863, the word didn't get out. Not that far. Especially not to Texas. Not past the Mississippi. So, it wasn't until June 19th, 1865, that Texican, Texans, I already say Texicans, found out that um, they were free. And they called that day Juneteenth. Now, it's a bigger holiday in the South than it is on the East Coast. But it's slowly getting around that Juneteenth is like a Emancipation Day where it was celebrated. Um, it hasn't become too commercialized yet, but we folks still don't know the value of our freedom, don't realize that slavery was a horrendous thing, don't realize that it was beyond uh, what the movies can do. It was a horrid thing. And now we were free. A lot of stuff came from that. A lot of stuff. Well, in the South, down around South Carolina, about a month after the president was assassinated, you know he was killed on tax day, April 15th, 1865. Did you know that? A general by the name of William Tecumseh Sherman uh, is the one who brought up this whole thing about the 40 acres and we somehow connected it to 40 acres and a mule but I'm going to explain that in a minute what happened was William T. Sherman created this thing called a special field order number 15 that he issued on January 16, 1865 and he was headquartered somewhere in, in near Charleston, South Carolina. Let's see if I can break this thing down. His special order. The first part of this thing says, um, The islands from Charleston south, the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea in the country bordering the St. John's River, Florida, are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes, now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the President of the United States. Section 2 specifies that these new communities, however, um, would be governed entirely by black people themselves on the islands and in the settlements hereafter to be established. No white person, whatever, um, unless military officers and soldiers detailed for duty, will be permitted to reside. And the sole and exclusive management of affairs will be left to the freed people themselves. By the laws of war and the orders of President of the United States, the Negro is free and must be dealt with as such. And finally, Section 3 uh, specifies the allocation of land. Each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground, and when it borders on some water channel with not more than 800 feet waterfront, the possession of which land the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate their title. Um, and with this order, 400,000 acres of land, which is just a strip of coastline, stretching from Charleston, South Carolina, to the St. John's River in Florida, which included Georgia's Sea Islands, and the mainland 30 miles um, in from the coast, as history books would tell us, to be redistributed to these newly freed slaves. Now, this thing went viral, as only it could go viral back in the day. This thing spread that the government was giving everybody 40 acres. Yeah. And it was just this one group of people that were giving this stuff. And one guy who was saying it. 
Here's how this radical proposal, which must have been completely blown the minds of the Confederates, actually came about. The abolitionists Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens and other radical Republicans had been actively advocating land redistribution to, quote, break the back of Southern slaveholders' power. But Sherman's plan only took shape after the meeting that he and Staten held uh, with those black ministers at 8 o'clock p.m. January 12th on the second floor of Charles Green's mansion on Savannah's uh, Macon Street. And in the broadest strokes, this 40 acres and a mule was their idea. Staten, aware that the great historical significance of the meeting presented Henry Ward Beecher, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous brother, a verbatim transcript of the discussion which Beecher read to his congregation at the New York Plymouth Church and which the New York Daily Tribune printed in full in its February 13, 1865 edition. Stanton told Beecher that, quote, for the first time in history of this nation, the representatives of the government had gone to these poor, debased people to ask them what they wanted for themselves. Stanton had um, suggested to Sherman that they gather the leaders of the local Negro community and asked them something no one else had apparently thought to ask. What do you want for your own people following the Civil War? And what they wanted astonishes us even today. Who were these 20 thoughtful leaders of the Negro community? Well, they were all ministers, mostly Baptists and Methodists. 11 of the 20 had been born free in slave states, of which 10 had lived as free men in the Confederacy during the course of the Civil War. Um, a man named James Lynch was born free in Maryland, a slave state, and only moved to the South two years before. The other nine ministers had been slaves in the South who became, quote, contraband and hence free, only because of the Emancipation Proclamation when Union forces liberated them. Their chosen leader and spokesman was a Baptist minister named Garrison Frazier, age 67, who had been born in Granville, North Carolina, and was a slave until 1857, when he, quote, purchased his freedom for himself and his wife for $1,000 in gold and silver, according to the New York Daily Tribune. Uh, Reverend Frazier had been in ministry for 35 years, and it was he who bore the responsibility of answering the 12 questions that Sherman and Stanton put to the group. And the stakes for the future of the Negro people was high. Frazier and his brothers did not disappoint. What well, they did tell Sherman and Stanton that the Negro most wanted, land. The way we can best take care of ourselves, Reverend Frazier began to add his answer at the crucial third question, is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. And we can do so, um, and that will help us maintain ourselves and have something to spare. We want to be placed on land until we're able to buy it and make it our own. And when asked next, where the free slaves would rather live, whether scattered among the whites or in colonies by themselves, without missing a beat, Reverend Frazier, as the transcript here says, replied that I prefer to live by ourselves, for there is a prejudice against us in the South that will take years to get over. And when polled individually around the table, all but one, James Lynch, 26, the man who had moved south from Baltimore, said that he agreed with Frazier. Four days later, Sherman issued special field order Number 15, after President Lincoln approved it. But, um, as you would know, President was assassinated. But let me get back to that before I get there. Um, the response to the order was immediate. The transcript of the meeting was reprinted in the black publication, The Christian Recorder, an editorial note and tone that, from this it will be seen that the colored people down south are not so dumb as many suppose them to be reflecting North-South slave-free black class tensions that continue well into the modern civil rights movement. The effect throughout the South was electric. Uh, the freedmen hastened to take advantage of the order. Baptist minister Ulysses uh, L. Houston, one of the group that had met with Sherman, led 1,000 blacks to Skidaway Island, Georgia, where they established a self-governing community with Houston as the black governor. And by June, 40,000 freedmen had been settled on 400 acres of Sherman land. And by the way, Sherman later ordered that the army could lend the new settlers mules, hence the phrase 40 acres and a mule. And what happened 
to its astonishing visionary program, which would have fundamentally altered the course of American race relations. Uh, Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's successor and a sympathizer for the South, overturned the order in the fall of 1865. Returned the land among, uh, along with uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coast to the planters who originally had owned it, to the very people who had declared war on the United States. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. agreed with these critical assessments of black American uh, deprivation, but generally um, couched his appeals. No, that's something else I was trying to write in here. Forget that part right there. Um, it's, um, our reparations is connected to that. But that's where it came from. That's the origins for this whole thing. And um, it's been picked up a couple of times. That's why I was going to talk about um, Dr. Martin Luther King when talking about reparations. And what's odd enough is that the heart of King's poorest people campaign, his main focus toward the end of his life was a universal basic income, not reparations. There's so many things about King that I loved that nobody seems to have paid any attention to, especially not the people who like to um, stir the pot and get folks all twisted. His poor people's campaign, again, let me say it again, was a universal basic income, not reparations. And King also said, don't build no statue for me. The thing we have in D.C. right now, he would not like at all. But nobody listening to the man. He said everything. and Everybody printed all his stuff, and his stuff is all public knowledge, but nobody hears. You know, I learned a new phrase this week, just a sidebar. Um, the Mandela effect. It's when you hear something and you think you heard it right, but you don't. You kind of put your own twist to it. So much stuff in the gun movement has the Mandela effect. And I'll get on to that in some other episode. So, Juneteenth. Really cool holiday. Emancipation celebration. In addition to watch night service for the black church banging the gong and shooting off stuff and they would drill holes in trees and put in shot shells and light them off make makeshift firecrackers to make huge explosions because free people own guns slaves do not hmm what a thought right what a concept next up I want to have uh, have you hear a guest of mine and uh, his name is Alan Gottlieb. He is the founder of the Second Amendment Foundation, a good friend of mine. And I had a little bit of fanboy moment, started studying over my words because I really respect this guy for what he's done. I have actually, over the last 20 years, tried to do what Alan would do. And I'm still doing it, actually. Um, but you'll see and hear about that later. Don't forget to check out crossbreedholsters.com. They have been a longtime supporter of this podcast. I love them even still. And uh, here is our conversation with the cool Alan Gottlieb from the Second Amendment Foundation. All right, friends, I got a great friend on the line with me today. I have Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation. I met this guy back in 1991 or two, I believe. I took a flight out to San Francisco, and um, the very first GRPC that I got a chance to be a part of, and I was all fired up for the gun rights movement, and I was new to the game, and this guy was welcoming and open and full of knowledge and wisdom. Alan, welcome to the show. Ken, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I really, really appreciate it. For those who don't know what the Second Amendment Foundation is, could you tell us? Well, we were founded back in 1974. I founded it, actually. Mm. And uh, our game plan really was to be an educational and legal defense lobby, uh, not lobbying group, an educational legal defense education type organization that had a long game plan of eventually trying to get a case to the United States Supreme Court. And what we found out was, <coughs> excuse me, what we found out was that there really wasn't much in the line of court cases or uh, law review articles or anything that would build a foundation to ever get a case to the U.S. Supreme Court. 
So we started by doing some legal scholars conferences, one done at Boston University, where we defined things we had to try and accomplish and build it, that foundation, getting law review articles written, things in public popular culture magazines, historical publications, a lot of research on what the Founding Fathers really said really meant uh, when they wrote the Second Amendment. Uh, and then we had another legal scholars conference at the University of Arizona, uh, where we didn't just have pro-gun scholars, but we also had people from the other side and some experts in con law. Uh, and what, a couple things came out of that that was really good. We learned what, where our arguments could be weak against the other side. And also we big, ran up a big problem that the Second Amendment never being really ruled on by the Supreme Court meant that it never got 14th Amendment incorporation either, so it wasn't applicable to the states. So all the laws we really wanted to challenge in federal court, we were never going to be able to do it uh, until the 14th Amendment got, you know, uh, the Second Amendment got incorporated through the 14th Amendment, making it applicable to the states. And so we had this unique problem, and the only way you could solve this problem was really to bring a court action in federal court that was not against the state law or a city law, but had to be against either the federal government, a federal government law, or like Washington D.C., a federal enclave, because it's not a state. And that was the Heller case. Uh, and of course, the Heller case then, you know, affirmed the individual right of uh, individuals to have Second Amendment rights, uh, knocked down the D.C. gun ban, uh, but didn't incorporate it to the states because D.C. wasn't the state. So the day that case was won, the Second Amendment Foundation filed what was known as McDonald v. Chicago. Uh, to knock out a similar gun ban in the city of Chicago. <clears throat> and we won that case all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court incorporated the Second Amendment through the 14th, so that now all these lawsuits you see being filed all across the country against various gun laws in federal courts uh, are all because of the McDonald case. Right now, the Second Amendment Foundation has about 30 such cases like this going on. And in fact, uh, the other day, we just uh, sort of semi won one, California uh, had a ban on gun shows in public fairgrounds, and we got a preliminary injunction by a federal judge who happened to even be an, an Obama appointee uh, ruled in our favor. So we've been making some, some very good progress winning firearms freedom one lawsuit at a time. One of the things that I like about your, your organization that I'm a part of is that that academic part that you brought up. I mean, I met um, Diamond and Cottrell and, and some of the scholars that has such an in-depth thing of history that I was ashamed of stuff I didn't know. And, and those first conferences that you had, you know, there was only a handful of people there per se, but the stuff was powerful, man. And now that you're involved in Supreme Court cases and people following your guys' leads on stuff, what's next for the SAF? Well, our gun rights policy conferences that you just mentioned now I have six, eight hundred people attending them. You know, key leaders from all across the country, representing national and state and local groups, uh, and it's been really great. I think we we need to intensify more uh, on the court cases and educating the public. Uh, of course, it takes money to do that, and it takes more staff to do that. Uh, and we seem to be at a plateau where we've grown to a point that we can do what we're doing now. But to get to the next level, it's going to take a whole lot more fundraising. And you know, we like to spend our time not fundraising. Would like to spend their time on fulfillment, winning gun rights. Hmm. Talking about plateaus, I'm at a plateau right, to, right too. Because there's a lot of people who are watching various groups implode and fight amongst each other, and we're looking to do something, um, and we want to help a cause that's going to help the cause, if you know what I mean, and and not kind of contribute to a, a meltdown. Why should somebody jump on the board? even though I'm, I can, I'm going to tell you all day why you should support SAF, but why should the new person support SAF, even if they're not into legal stuff? Well, first of all, as a gun owner, if you care about Second Amendment rights, it's not ever smart to put all your eggs in one basket anyway. You should be supporting multiple groups and organizations on a national, state, and local level to, to start with. But, uh, you know, if you take a look now, though, at the case law that's been, been won in the courts supporting Second Amendment rights, over 80% of that case law have been won by the Second Amendment Foundation and or our attorneys. We have built the foundation for future litigation, protecting gun rights and expanding gun rights in our country. Nobody holds a candle to what we've accomplished, and we've really done it on a bare bones budget. People who support us get an awful lot of bang for their buck. And politically, here's something else that I learned about you guys. You're not all Republicans either. This like, uh, you guys have the the fair side. I mean, it's just it's an equal group of people. Can you expound on that? 
Well, I don't know how much equal it is in, in, in real numbers, but we try to be as inclusive as we can. We don't win this fight by, by, you know, by subtraction and division. We win it by addition and multiplication. So we work with lots of, you know, lots of people across the country, not just Democrats per se. We work with a lot of minority groups. We work with, you know, gay and lesbian organizations. Uh, we're Hispanic groups. Anything we can do to increase the base of Second Amendment support, we work with everybody. And uh, we've been very, very inclusive. And so lots of people who feel some organizations that, you know, exclude them or they don't feel comfortable there. I think everybody can feel comfortable working with the Second Amendment Foundation. And that's the words I was trying to find. Because, <laughs> because in your group was the first time I've met so many different types of people that had the same beliefs as me. And it was kind of cool. And plus... You guys are givers. You give out stacks of stuff. You have to bring extra suitcases to your GRPCs. Tell us about that. Well, we, we give out lots of materials and obviously you know, $150, $200 worth of, worth of books uh, for people's Second Amendment libraries. Uh, so we can help educate the public. We give out free to the people who attend our conferences, be it the Gun Rights Policy Conference or some of our state leadership training conferences. Uh, you know, we, 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 we spend the money back on the people. I mean, uh, people can see real accomplishments for what we do with our, our dollars. Uh, and it's really important because we want, we're trying to build a movement. It's not just about the Second Amendment Foundation. It's about the whole gun rights community. And I feel that, that way everybody feels like they're a part of the foundation and we interact with everybody on an equal level. And it's not from the top down. A lot of our things can end up from the bottom up where local grassroots activists influence us a whole lot too. So it's a two-way street. Yeah, yeah, you guys have impressed me forever in a day, and I'm glad to know you. How's Joe doing? Uh, Joe Tarter was actually going to be retiring in another month or so uh, from full time. Well, he's going to stay on as president of the foundation and on our board, but he's not going to be working uh, full time uh, anymore as basically putting out our editing and publishing our, our publications. Okay. He's getting on in a little bit in years, but his 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 long term knowledge and expertise. Uh, has gone a long way to help build the foundation, and we're really appreciative of everything Joe's done with us and hope he sticks with us for a lot more years. Yeah, so I agree with that totally. That guy was like, um, he, he's reached out to me so many times, and because of that, I'll never like let SAF go anywhere. I mean, between you two, how often do, do you get a chance to talk to the head of an organization that's doing so much, and they're not pretentious, they're not, um, it's not 500 layers of people in between them, just regular people, even though you wear cool, cool bow ties, um, <laughs> <laughs> you're well, still a regular uh, dude. Yeah, you know, Ken. In all honesty, we try to get rid of the bureaucracy and the layers, and let you know individual members and supporters and people actually reach us and, and talk with us. We get some of our best ideas from from people in the general public. So if we close ourselves off uh, in communications, it, it's really we we don't we we couldn't be who we are as successful as we are. So we we like to be be real open about it and. Being small and lean in a lot of ways means we can respond real quickly. We're like the Marines to hit the beachhead first before the Army can get there. Don't and many of the Second Amendment battles that have been won haven't been won just because of us, but it's been won in some ways because we got to the beachhead first and held it until all the troops could get there. Amen, man. How about um, the GRPC? It's, it's in Arizona this year, right? Yeah, this year our gun rights policy conference is in Phoenix uh, uh, at the Sheridan Crescent Hotel. Uh, September 20th, 21, and 22. The conference is free. Uh, we give out materials free. You have to pay your own expenses getting there. Uh, but but it, it's an unbelievable event to, to attend. Uh, people can register at our website at saf.org, saf.org, or put Second Amendment Foundation in your browser and it'll pop up and it's for, look for the banner for the Gun Rights Policy Conference and click on it. It's an amazing event and I always love to you know, see people coming to it who've been at previous ones who uh, have experienced it before but I also like to see the new people come who've never been there before so it's an open invitation to all of your listeners and followers alright I'm definitely coming this week this year and, uh, excellent I had to, we'll look forward I had to, to seeing you there thanks man I had, to, I had to stop some other stuff to make sure that I made this one it's an important year you know coming into the, 20, the 2020 election cycle right now you know uh, again you know our gun rights are only always one election away from extinction. And in this particular case, this election is going to be very critical, very important. The issue's got more polarized than ever before. Gun owners and gun rights are more demonized than ever before. 
The culture war is, is really heated up a lot. And if you really care about your rights and your freedoms, be at the Gun Rights Policy Conference, saf.org. All right. And this is Alan M. Gottlieb, my friend and brother from another mother. Man, best to you and the family. I look forward to seeing you in September. Me too. I haven't seen you in too long, so I hope can I'll see you at the Gun Rights Policy Conference in Phoenix. All right. All right. That's a wrap for this week. I'm going to make sure that you know that um, you are loved, just in case nobody has told you this today. I love you, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Thanks for watching my very first vlog of episode 619 of the Black Man with the Gun Show podcast. Until next week, shalom, baby.